He will forever be known as the 9-11 hijacker who deliberately crashed United Flight 93 into a field in Pennsylvania. The 9-11 commission found that he was an odd fit for Al-Qaeda, westernized with a German girlfriend, and he almost backed out of the plot at the last minute. This video, seen here for the first time, appears to confirm that Zia Jara was prodded along by Al-Qaeda. Jara frequently stumbles through his own martyrdom tape can't maintain a serious tone. His Al-Qaeda handlers coach him to be more dramatic. Start again. One of them scolds him off camera. This speech requires passion. Why don't you try a different approach? A second man chimes in. Ziad Jara was the hijacker pilot of United Airlines Flight 93, which was intended to crash into the Capitol or White House as part of the 9-11 attacks. Jara trained as a pilot in the United States to prepare for the operation. However, due to a passenger revolt, he was unable to reach his intended target and instead crashed the plane into an empty field in Shanksville, Pennsylvania. A dive into Jarrah's background reveals how a seemingly ordinary man who almost backed out of the 9-11 plot became an essential part of it. Ziad Jarrah was born in Mazra, Lebanon, into a wealthy Muslim family. His father, Samir Jarrah, worked as a social service inspector for the Lebanese government while his mother was an elementary school teacher. According to his father, Jara had dreamed of becoming a pilot since childhood, but his father discouraged him, saying, I stopped him from being a pilot. I only have one son, and I was afraid he would crash. In 1996, Jara graduated from a private Christian high school in Lebanon before moving to Greifswald, Germany, with his cousin, where he studied German and then dentistry. With the benefit of hindsight, Jara's path to extremism seems surprising. When he first moved to Germany, he was recognized for his social habits, including partying, drinking, and enjoying the beach, rather than for any signs of radicalism. He started dating Isil Senguin, the daughter of Turkish immigrants. Although he continued to share an apartment in Greifswald with his cousin, Jara was mostly at Senguin's apartment. According to acquaintances, by late 1996, Jara began displaying signs of radicalization. After returning from a visit back home to Lebanon, Jara began to follow the Quran more strictly. He read Arabic brochures about jihad, discussed holy war with friends, and expressed dissatisfaction with his former life, stating a wish not to leave the world, quote, in a natural way. In September 1997, Jara moved to Hamburg to study aircraft engineering at the Technical University of Hamburg Harburg and took a job at a Volkswagen paint shop in Wolfsburg. His motive behind the move to Hamburg remains unclear. Following his move to Hamburg that fall, Jara started visiting Senguen in Greifswald on weekends until she relocated to Bochum a year later to attend dental school. During this period, Jara's focus shifted increasingly to religion and his visits to Senguen became rarer. He began criticizing her for not being religious enough and for dressing too provocatively. Jara adopted a full beard, started praying regularly, and avoided introducing Senguin to his Hamburg friends, citing their religiousness and his own embarrassment. In 1999, Jara disclosed to Senguin his plans to wage jihad, claiming there was no greater honor than dying for Allah. Despite frequent disputes, they always reconciled after their breakups. Jara lived in several places in Hamburg, but never with his future co-conspirators. It is uncertain how or when he became involved with Mohammed Atta's network, also known as the Hamburg Cell. The Hamburg Cell refers to a group of radical Islamist terrorists who were key operatives in the planning and execution of the 9-11 attacks. The cell consisted of several key figures, including Mohammed Atta, Marwan al-Shehi, and Ramzi bin al-Shib. His friendship with Ramzi bin al-Shib grew after they met at the Quds Mosque, which Jara began attending regularly in late 1997. The mosque was notable for its association with Mohammed Haydar Zamar, a prominent Islamist known for his strong advocacy of violent jihad. Whether due to Zamar's influence or another source of motivation, the Hamburg cell ultimately took steps to put their extremist beliefs into practice. By late 1999, they were prepared to leave their student lives in Germany behind for the sake of violent jihad. 
the four became central figures in a group of radical Muslims, frequently holding meetings at their Marienstrasse apartment that featured intensely anti-American rhetoric. Meeting three to four times a week, the group developed into a sect with members, mostly interacting with each other. Throughout 1999, Ada and his group grew increasingly radical and secretive, speaking only in Arabic to keep their conversations hidden. When the four main members of the Hamburg cell departed Germany for Afghanistan late that year, it is unlikely they were aware of the planned 9-11 attacks, as there is no evidence linking them to Al-Qaeda before this period. Later in 1999, the group became dedicated to violent jihad. Initially, they planned to leave Germany to fight against the Russians in Chechnya, but a chance meeting with extremist Khalid al-Masri redirected them. Masri connected the group with an Al-Qaeda contact in Duisburg, who advised them to first travel to Afghanistan for training before heading to Chechnya. In November 1999, the group arrived at the Taliban office in Quetta. They were then transported to Kandahar, where they were introduced to Osama bin Laden. After a private meeting with bin Laden, all four pledged their loyalty to him and volunteered for a martyrdom mission. They later met with Al-Qaeda military commander Mohammed Atef, who informed them of their assignment to a top-secret mission. As the first step, Atef instructed them to return to Germany and enroll in flight school. They were also told that Al-Qaeda operative Nawaf al-Hazmi would join them in hijacking American Airlines Flight 77. In early 2000, Jara, Atta, and Bin al-Shib returned to Hamburg after their time in Afghanistan. Before departing, they met with Khalid Sheikh Mohammed, who had originally devised the plan to use airplanes as weapons and crash them into U.S. buildings. Mohammed provided them with advice on evading government detection and offered guidance on how to navigate life in the United States. After leaving Afghanistan, Jara claimed his old passport was lost and obtained a new one. He then returned to Lebanon, securing a U.S. visa on May 25th. During this period, the hijackers made efforts to blend in, with Jara shaving his beard and, according to Sengwen, acting much more like the person she had first met, though he never mentioned his trip to Afghanistan. Despite this, Jara's family grew worried about his increasing extremism, and his father asked a cousin, who had been close to Jara since childhood, to step in. Jara, the only hijacker who kept in close contact with his family and stayed in a relationship, may have had doubts about the plot. The four Al-Qaeda operatives initially explored flight schools in Europe, but ultimately chose to train in the United States due to lower costs and fewer required training hours. All group members obtained new passports and visas, except for Bin al-Shib, whose visa was denied, preventing him from traveling to the U.S. with the others. Bin al-Shib had planned to join Jara at the flight school in Florida, but his visa denial left Jara largely on his own in the U.S. Jara arranged to attend the Florida Flight Training Center in Venice, Florida. He flew from Dusseldorf to Newark on June 27, 2000, and then made his way to Florida. Once there, he began the private pilot program moved in with some of his flight instructors, and bought a car. By August, Jara had earned his private pilot certificate. In October, he returned to Germany to visit Sanguen, traveling with her to Paris before heading back to the U.S. He stayed in touch with her through regular phone calls and emails. Jara earned his instrument certificate in November, and by December, had obtained his commercial pilot license and started flight simulator training. After traveling to Lebanon in late December 2000, he returned to Florida via Germany in early January 2001, with Sengwen accompanying him to confirm his pilot training. Sengwen stayed for 10 days, even visiting his flight school. On January 26, Jara returned to Lebanon to visit his sick father, staying until mid-February. He then spent a few days with Sengwen in Germany, before returning to the U.S. on February 25th. In mid-March, Jara briefly stayed in Decatur, Georgia, for unknown reasons and visited Sanguin again in Germany on March 30th before returning to Florida on April 13th. After returning to the U.S. in April, Jarrah rented an apartment in Hollywood, Florida near Ada and Shehi. He joined a gym and got a Florida driver's license. In early June, Jarrah traveled from Fort Lauderdale to Philadelphia for more flight training at Hortman Aviation, where he flew with an instructor along the Hudson River near New York City. During the summer of 2001, the pilot hijackers conducted reconnaissance flights, traveling in first class to observe aircraft types and evaluate the feasibility of using box cutters for the hijacking. His relationship with Mohammed Atta was reportedly tense, a topic of concern during Atta's July meeting with Bin al-Shib in Spain. Atta disapproved of his frequent family visits, and Jara, having spent much of his time alone in the U.S., 
felt sidelined from key decisions, growing resentful of Atta's authority. Khalid Sheikh Mohammed, worried that he might abandon the mission, even directed funds toward Zacharias Musawi as a potential replacement pilot. On July 25th, Jera flew from Miami to Dusseldorf on a one-way ticket bought by Sanguin. Despite their tensions, Ada is said to have driven him to the Miami airport. After spending a few days with Sanguin in Germany, Jera met with Bin al-Shib, who persuaded him not to abandon the mission. By August 30th, Jera had secured his ticket for United Airlines Flight 93. On September 7th, he flew from Fort Lauderdale to Newark, New Jersey. The following day, he made several phone calls to both Lebanon and Germany, including a call to Sanguin. On September 9th, Jarrah was pulled over by a Maryland state trooper while speeding on Interstate 95. He was en route to meet with the other hijackers. During the traffic stop, Jarrah remained calm and cooperative. The officer issued him a routine speeding ticket, and there was nothing unusual about the interaction that raised any suspicion. The night before the attacks, he wrote a farewell letter to Sanguen, expressing his deep love for her and asking for her understanding regarding the devastating actions he was about to take. At 5.01 a.m. on September 11th, Jera made a phone call from Newark to Marwan al Shehi, the pilot of United Airlines Flight 175 in Boston, likely to confirm the attack plans were in motion. Between 7.03 and 7.39 a.m., all four hijackers checked in for their flight, with Jera having no luggage. Security checkpoint staff did not notice anything suspicious about the hijackers. He boarded at 7.48 a.m. and took seat 1B. The plane was originally set to depart at 8 a.m., but was delayed on the ground until 8.42 due to heavy congestion at the airport. The other three hijacked flights took off within 15 minutes of their scheduled departure times. By the time Flight 93 was in the air, Flight 11 was just four minutes from striking the North Tower, and Flight 175 was in the process of being hijacked. Meanwhile, the terrorists on Flight 77 had not yet acted, but were only nine minutes away from seizing the cockpit. As the attacks were unfolding, air traffic officials began sending out warnings. At 9.24, Flight 93 received the message, Beware any cockpit intrusion. Two aircraft hit World Trade Center. However, the pilot was confused by the message and asked for it to be repeated. This was the final radio contact before the cockpit was preached at 9.28. By this time, Flights 11 and 175 had already hit their targets and Flight 77 was nine minutes away from hitting the Pentagon. It remains unclear why the hijackers waited 46 minutes to storm the cockpit, but the plane sharply descended by 680 feet in 30 seconds, suggesting the attack had begun. Air traffic controllers in Cleveland and nearby pilots heard what seemed to be unintelligible sounds of possible screaming or a struggle. The cockpit voice recorder captured the final 30 minutes of Flight 93 starting at 931. It recorded Jera attempting to address the passengers, but he accidentally pressed the wrong button, transmitting the message to Cleveland air traffic controllers instead, an error Mohammed Atta also made on Flight 11. Uh, the captain, uh, I would like to the passengers and crew aboard United Airlines Flight 93 made a series of critical phone calls during the final moments of the flight. Using GTE airphones and mobile phones, they placed 35 airphone calls and two cell phone calls. These calls provided vital information about the hijacking to family members, friends, and officials on the ground. 10 passengers and two crew members successfully connected with their contacts, relaying details of the situation inside the plane, including the hijacking and their plans to resist the terrorists. Several passengers on United Airlines Flight 93 were credited with leading the plan to attack the hijackers once they realized the situation. The key individuals involved in formulating the plan to storm the cockpit included Tom Burnett, a businessman from California who made multiple phone calls to his wife, Dina. He expressed awareness that the hijackers planned to use the plane as a weapon and was one of the leaders of the counterattack. Todd Beamer, a software salesman who famously said, Let's roll during his call with a GTE airphone operator, signaling the start of the passenger's plan to take control of the plane. Mark Bingham, a public relations executive and rugby player who called his mother to tell her about the hijacking and was involved in the planning and attempt to overpower the terrorists. 
and Jeremy Glick, a sales manager and judo champion, who spoke to his wife Liz, and together they discussed the plan to resist the hijackers. He also played a key role in organizing the passengers' response. Flight 93's passenger revolt began at 9.57, following a vote to act. As the passengers fought back, the plane veered off its course to Washington, D.C., and the hijackers responded with violent maneuvers. Jarrah rolled the plane side to side to unbalance the passengers. The cockpit voice recorder picked up the sounds of crashing screams and shattering glass. By 10 a.m., Jarrah stabilized the plane and asked, Is that it? Shall we finish it off? Another hijacker responded, No. Not yet. When they all come, we finish it off. Jarrah then pitched the aircraft up and down again. The recorder picked up the sound of passengers ramming the cockpit door with a food cart. Jarrah halted the violent movements at 10.01, reciting the takbir twice. The final recorded words were calmly spoken in English, pull it up. At 10.03, the plane crashed into an empty field in Stony Creek, Pennsylvania. With 5,500 to 7,000 gallons of fuel remaining, the explosion created a massive fireball, instantly killing everyone on board. Debris including the cockpit, spread across 163 acres. The only confirmed witness to the actual crash and the last person to view United 93 while it was airborne was Nevin Lambert from Stony Creek. He reported seeing the aircraft in an inverted dive, crashing at a 45 degree angle. Authorities located fragments such as paper and nylon spread over an area extending eight miles from where the crash occurred. Jarrah's passport was discovered among the wreckage. Despite the extensive destruction caused by the crash, the passport survived relatively intact, providing crucial evidence linking Jarrah to the hijacking. There are theories that Jarrah may not have been a hijacker, with some suggesting he was an innocent passenger, or that his identity was stolen. These claims arise from observations that his actions differed from the other hijackers, and that some passengers reported only three hijackers on the plane. Friends and family claimed that leading up to the attacks, Jarrah did not display the same political anger or strict cultural conservatism as the other hijackers and those who worked at the flight school he attended described him as a normal person. The 9-11 Commission report determined that without any doubt, Jarrah was a hijacker on United 93 and the release of a video in October 2006 showing Jarrah and Mohammed Atta as Jarrah recorded his will has further discredited claims of him being innocent. On September 13th, investigators located the flight data recorder, followed by the discovery of the cockpit voice recorder the next day. Initially, the FBI did not release the recording, despite requests from Congresswoman Ellen Tauscher and family members of those on the plane. Although such recordings are generally restricted, the FBI allowed the relatives of Flight 93 victims to listen to the tape in a closed session on April 18th, 2002. The tape was also played for jurors during the Zacharias Musawi trial, and the transcript was publicly released on April 12, 2006. The audio recording itself has not been made public at the victim's family's request. As United 93 was hijacked, Vice President Dick Cheney gave the order to shoot the plane down. The U.S. military scrambled fighter jets to respond to the escalating threat. Within minutes of the initial hijacking reports, the North American Aerospace Defense Command and U.S. Air Force deployed fighter jets to intercept the aircraft. As the situation developed, the military was aware of the potential threat posed by Flight 93. However, due to the plane's rapid and unpredictable trajectory, it became clear that intercepting it before a possible attack was challenging. Fighter jets from nearby bases were in the air and heading towards the vicinity of the hijacked flight, but they arrived too late to prevent the crash. The bravery of the passengers and crew was widely recognized. In 2002, Congress posthumously honored all 33 passengers and seven crew members of Flight 93 with the Congressional Gold Medal, one of the highest civilian awards in the United States. Other key memorials include the Flight 93 National Memorial in Stony Creek Township, Pennsylvania. The memorial covers over 2,200 acres and includes several key features that honor the victims, including the Wall of Names, a white marble wall inscribed with the names of all 40 passengers and crew members. The crash site itself is preserved as a field where visitors can reflect on the heroism displayed by those aboard Flight 93. As always, thank you for watching my video. 
If you found this video helpful, please like, share, and subscribe for more content. Be sure to check out my previous video on Muhammad Atta and the 9-11 attacks for further details into all the events occurring that day.